Welcome to Caregiving Club On Air. This podcast is dedicated to the millions of family caregivers who want wellness tips and self-care solutions, who seek expert advice, and who want news about healthy aging and how to create well home design in our forever homes. I'm Sherry Snelling, a corporate gerontologist, author, and educator, a TV interviewer, host, and news commentator. I'm joining you from Southern California, where our interviews and news take us all across the country to explore the many ways to help you on your caregiving journey and to lift you up here at Caregiving Club On Air. Welcome to Caregiving Club On Air and our June episode, where we're going to focus on June's National Alzheimer's and Brain Health Awareness Month, as well as the National Day of Joy on June 26th. We're going to talk about staying hydrated, uh, Employee Wellness Month, Dementia Friendly Design, Father's Day, and also World Music Month. I'm Sherry Snelling, your host and gerontologist and author. And we have really great interviews for this episode. We start with Sadia Gazadar, who is the Chief Happiness Officer of Comfort Keepers. She's going to share with us the latest survey from their annual survey on happiness and positivity for National Day of Joy on June 26th. And then we're going to talk to Deborah Levy and Dr. Charles Wilcox of the Alzheimer's Association, where we're going to talk all things Alzheimer's caregiving, including the latest drug development, diagnostics, support, and all the things that you want to know about Alzheimer's for National Alzheimer's and Brain Health Awareness Month. As we dive into our caregiver wellness news, we're going to, again, look at uh, Alzheimer's and caregiving, but also the physical wellness aspect of staying hydrated which is National Hydration Day on June 23rd. We're going to talk a little bit about Father's Day and the difference between caring for moms and dads. And then we're going to switch to Well Home Design News, where I will share with you some information from our free webinar that we're offering to our podcast listeners on dementia-friendly design. And also June's National Employee Wellness Month, where I'll share an excerpt from my book, Be Time Monday, the intellectual wellness chapter where I talk about life work balance using biophilic design in both your home and your office. And as always, we end our episode with our Me Time Monday wellness hack. This one is on musical menus and sonic seasoning where we combine eating and dining with music all for, again, Alzheimer's Brain uh, on Brain Health Awareness Month, as well as World Music Month. So stay with us for that wellness hack. It's really interesting. But for now, let's take a look at our caregiver wellness news. So for caregiver wellness news, I want to start with, as we mentioned earlier, June is National Alzheimer's and Brain Health Awareness Month. And uh, just a couple of months ago, the Alzheimer's Association came out with their facts and figures report, which they do every year, updating the statistics and new information. We now know that nearly 7 million Americans are living with Alzheimer's or related dementia. We also know that about 11 million Americans are caregiving for um, those with Alzheimer's or dementia. And the prevalence of the disease is going to almost double over the next two to three decades. We're gonna have about 13 million people in the US who will have this disease. So it's kind of, you know, it's on our radar now. It's, you know, top of mind for so many. Um, It's still a, a very scary diagnosis because there's no cure. Um, And because of the nature of the disease in the fact that not only is there memory loss, but there can very often be behavioral and personality changes, lack of communication, and just an overall kind of degeneration sometimes with quality of life. Although I would advocate that throughout all the stages of this disease, even though it does progress um, and get worse over time, there is still quality of life that we see in a lot of dementia Um, adults who are in the later stages of the disease, they still um, get happiness and um, feel comfort with multisensory input. So those are things like smell, taste, touch, um, you know, visual sight cues, and all of those things are really important 
So it's something to definitely think about for those of us who are caregivers, whether it's rubbing lotion on our loved one's hands, brushing their hair, bringing in the sense of maybe the season or, or their favorite dish of cooking, um, you know, having green uh, greenery and, and beautiful colors that we can look upon and uh, playing music. We know that music, and, and of course, June is also World Music Month, which is perfect because music is such a powerful therapeutic tool for Alzheimer's. And it's something that, uh, you know, family caregivers need to really uh, educate yourself around because the music memory is one of the last memories that Alzheimer's adults keep. And it's pretty amazing to watch. If you haven't seen the documentary Alive Inside, it's so powerful. Or, you know, we've talked before on this podcast about the... Um, I think it was the 60 Minutes interview with Tony Bennett at the end of his life where he really could not carry on a conversation. But the minute that the music started playing, he was the Tony Bennett that we've all known through the decades. So that music memory inside the brain is really powerful. And it's a great tool for all of us to keep in mind, uh, but particularly for those with Alzheimer's. So, um, you know, one of the things I found really interesting there was a Wall Street Journal article. I'm going to share the link on our episode guide page. But it really talked about Alzheimer's not being a disease of older people. Because that's what we think, right? You don't get it until you're older, you know, 70s, 80s or beyond. You know, uh, that's what we think. But the reality is, is that a lot of the lifestyle choices that we can make early in life, and I'm talking 20s and 30s can actually reduce our risk of developing Alzheimer's later in life. So it really isn't an older person's disease. Yes, maybe that's when we get diagnosed and that's where we see, you know, the impact of the disease. But it's something that, uh, first of all, we know that most people, uh, even upon diagnosis, have been living with the disease between 10 and 20 years. But even before that, there are things we can do to try to decrease that risk. So it's really important to understand a lot of the lifestyle factors. And I, I have a whole chapter in my book, Me Time Monday, that talks about this. There's also other great books. We're going to be talking to Dr. Charles Wilcox in a minute, um, who's an Alzheimer's Association board member. He has a great book out that we'll mention. Uh, by the way, all the proceeds of that book go to the Alzheimer's Association, which is really great. Um, but I just think it's really interesting to change the way we look at the disease, not just think of it as an older person's disease. Disease. This is a lifestyle disease that we might have a little bit more control over than we originally think or are thinking about. Now, one of the areas that really helps brain health that we may not think about is staying hydrated, right? Um, we know with older adults that a lot of the things that we're seeing, dizziness, delirium, you know, cognitive um, fading, can sometimes be related to hydration. 50% of Americans of all ages are dehydrated. So good, okay? We need to stay hydrated because it not only helps our brain health, it helps our overall body health. So, you know, there's a, there's a couple of things. I wrote a chapter in my book, uh, Me Time Monday book called Nature's Cleanse, which is really about using water to really give yourself that deep cleanse that we need throughout our body for physical health. Um, we know that if you're just 1% dehydrated, it's going to have a 5% uh, impact on your cognitive functioning. So in, in other words, the more dehydrated you are, the less your brain is going to perform properly. So we know that there's a deep connection between this. Um, the National Academy of Medicine says women should drink 91 ounces and men should drink about 120, 124 ounces of water a day, much more than the old fashioned 64 ounces a day, you know, eight ounces, eight cups or whatever that we used to talk about. So it's a much higher level of intake of water every day. And by the way, it doesn't include every liquid. So if you're drinking a beer or if you're drinking coffee or if you're drinking um, soda, that doesn't count. We're talking about water, folks, okay? That's that's really the the uh, the prescription here, if you will. Um, now, there's another way to look at how much you need. And I like personalized medicine. I don't like the one size fits all. Here's the number. It works for everybody. Because let's face it, all of our bodies are physically different. We all have, uh, you know, different reaction to different things. We are different sizes, uh, different ages. You know, we might need things a little differently. So I like personalized uh, formulas. And one of the personalized formula for hydration is to take your weight uh, and turn that into 
a number. So let's just say you weigh 160 pounds. Okay, so 160. Now cut that in half, 80. That's the number of ounces that you should be drinking every day to optimize your water intake. That's a little bit more personalized than just the numbers I threw out there from the National Academy of Medicine. Now, the caveat is, of course, uh, if you are on medications or you're experiencing something called edema, which is water retention, you know, can happen with pregnant women, can happen again with people who are older, who maybe are not as active, have a little bit more neuropathy in their feet. And so they have a little bit more swelling, maybe around the ankles or uh, other joints, Um or you're an athlete, a pro or an amateur athlete, and you're you're sweating a lot, that's going to impact how much water you really need. So for the medical issues I mentioned, always talk to your doctor about how much hydration you really should be getting. For those pro-am weekend warriors and workout queens out there, um, there's something really great called, I came across the Swenty, I think is how it's pronounced, the Swenty Wearable. It's a patch you know, just like a nicotine patch, but it's a patch you put on your arm when you're working out. And what it does is it regulates how much um, water you need after your workout to replenish your body. So again, a very personalized way of looking at that. But I thought that was kind of cool. I wanted to bring that here to your attention because I know a lot of you are using a lot of these new technologies and wearables and all that. Now, turning to Father's Day, which of course is June 17th, you know, I do a lot of employee webinars on communication for caregivers. How do we talk to our older parents about long-term care, end-of-life wishes? Um, you know, how do we have conversations around driving? How do we have conversations around where to live and and all of those types of things? And so, um, you know, I'm kind of immersed in this communication world and have been for most of my career. And I wrote an article for PBS Next Avenue about how to talk to moms versus dads. I think in general, what we need to think about as family caregivers is that dads, as they grow older, are still looking to maintain their independence and control. And that's not to say that moms aren't as well, but that's really where their focus is. So we have to think about that when we're having conversations, um, not to jeopardize that or, you know, um, talk negatively about taking away control or independence, because that's really where their goals are as they age. For moms, it typically tends to fall more in the safety and security bucket. You know, I, I maybe I'm living alone now because, you know, I'm widowed or divorced. I want to stay safe. I want to stay secure. I want to have both. I think parents want to have better quality of life. But it's just a, it's a slight nuance and it's a way to use language in the proper way. And I'm going to have a link to the article so you can read a little bit more about that. And of course, for those of you out there who are HR benefits and, and uh, HR directors, I do do a lot of uh, educational webinars for employees. And that's one of them is the communication piece of it. Um, so that's for Father's Day. That's just our little quick note to Father's Day. And I want to just do a shout out to my late dad um, and my late stepdad, who really raised me. Two wonderful men gave me great gifts, very different gifts for my life. But I'm just so grateful that I had that relationship. And what you're going to hear now from Sadia is of Comfort Keepers is how adult children are looking at their relationship with their older parents uh, and some really wonderful, positive, happy, joyful, you know, um, findings from the National Day of Joy survey that Comfort Keepers does every year. I mean, we need more of this, folks, right? Um, I'm here to bring you news and great interviews, but also we're here to uplift people and our listeners. And I always love to do this interview with Sadia because it's so much focused on the positive. You know, there's a lot of bad news out there about social media impacts and, you know, other things that are going on. But this is a twist and a turn on let's focus on that positive happiness factor. So here is my interview with Sadia Gajadar of Comfort Keepers. So I am so thrilled to have our guest on, uh, who is Sadia Dajadar, who is the Chief Happiness Officer of Comfort Keepers. I've always said I love that title. I think it's the best title out there. Um, but Sadia is joining us again this year 
Uh, she was on with us last year to tell us about the latest survey that Comfort Keepers has just done for their National Day of Joy coming up on June 26. Sadia, welcome back to Caregiving Club on Air. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for including me today. Yeah, of course. Well, this is always such a great, you know, conversation and we get to talk about lots of good, positive stuff that's happening. But, you know, before we dive into the survey results, just again, for our audience, tell us a little bit about what Comfort Keepers does, what kind of services that you provide for uh, older adults and family caregivers. Oh, yes, of course. So Comfort Keepers is a leading provider of in-home care for seniors and any adults that need assistance in being able to stay in the comfort of their own homes. So whether that's mobility assistance, transportation, um, maybe nutrition, um, errands, any of those types of things, we help with that medication reminders. But Comfort Keepers is different than other in-home care providers because we focus on joy, connection, uh, positivity. We like to say we like to focus on what's possible instead of limitations. And we think that makes a real difference in people's lives that, you know, maybe that's something they're so excited to hear about when usually that's, it's sometimes a negative experience to think about when your parents might start needing in-home care. You know, the adult children that we work with, they are trying to figure it out. They are trying, they are struggling. They're trying to understand how best to navigate their parents' aging. And lots of times they're not as prepared because there's just not a lot of conversations out there in this country about how to help your, your aging loved ones, you know, sort of navigate their later years. You know, they just want to stay positive. We know that those adult daughters who tend to be the ones who are more often going to be that primary family caregiver they are struggling with what to do. They just want to stay that adult daughter. They want to maintain that relationship. So that's one of the things that we try to focus on the most is maintaining that possibility, that positivity, and that's such a welcome message. So it's so interesting because I am actually an adult daughter of, um, you know, older parents myself. You know, my mom's 80, my dad's 89. My mom, you know, she's so great. Our family heritage is that uh, my parents are from Guyana, in South America. And so we have a lot of, it's very Indian heritage and culture. So the very favorite thing that my mom makes for me is curry. We live in different States on different coasts. So I don't get to see her all that often. So when I see her, we just like to do some of those things that we love. And she loves to make curry for me. It's my favorite dish and I love it. But so my mom, you know, even though she's in good health, she's had three knee replacements, if you can count that. And she actually needs another one. Um, so I really want her not to be in pain. So cooking curry is very involved and I have really just struggled with having her do that for me. I'm like, mom, no, I will, let's go out to dinner. Let me cook for you or let me help you. And she just would get really mad, Sherry. And she would be like, no, I'm really making it for you. And then I think it's actually the work that we started doing with comfort keepers that made me realize that the best thing I could do for her is let her be that mom and take care of me. So now it's fine. You know, I have no guilt. I let her make me curry. She cooks, she cleans up and I have to sit in a chair and that's what she wants. And it has brought her so much joy. You can totally see the benefit of why, of why that's important. Yeah. And I, I love that story. And I'm so glad that you shared that with us. You know, uh, we, we've talked before, my mom's turning 80 this year too. Mm -hmm. Hope she doesn't mind that I'm, I'm telling her age here, but you know, it, I think there's something about when our parents get older, we're so focused on their physical health. We forget that the social, you know, side of health, which is staying connected with us, doing the things they've always loved to do, so important for our older parents. And, you know, you don't want to take that away. I mean, it might be a little tougher, like you said, for your mom to be on her feet while she's cooking and cleaning up, but it brings her joy. And that is really kind of the topic of the day today that we're going to talk about. Um, so, and, I, and I think it's wonderful that Comfort Keepers also focuses on that. Because again, we often think of, you know, uh, a home care agency is coming in and thinking about the health and the medical issues that the older adult has and not necessarily always thinking about their social health and their emotional health, which you guys really focus on and is really terrific. So let's dive into the survey. Now, this is the sixth year that you've been doing this survey around joy and happiness, and it is for the National Day of Joy, which we'll kind of talk about at the end. But tell us a little bit about this year's survey and what were some of the key findings that you saw? 
Yeah, well, we started doing the survey because we established this annual day of joy six years ago. Um, because we wanted our brand promise is elevating the human spirit, which is really, again, about that joy, the connection, the positivity. And for us having a day and for it's the last Wednesday of June every year. And so this year it is on June 26th. So sometimes we do this accompanying survey to just showcase and validate the importance of positivity in our everyday lives. Because people forget as you're going around your day to day life, gosh, maybe I just need to stop and take a minute. So this year's theme is the power of positivity for all the reasons that we just talked about. Um, we actually surveyed 2000 adults this year and focusing on positivity, it just helped us and it gave us a few key insights that I think are really helpful. You know, it's really important to remember what positivity does for us, not only mentally, but physically, because I guarantee it doesn't matter how old we are. We all want the same things in our lives whether you're 20, 30, 40, 50, or 60, you want, you want joy, you want positivity, you want love, you want purpose, your connection. And I guarantee you that doesn't change when you become 70 or 80. You just don't all of a sudden like, no, I don't need that anymore. I just want to be kept safe and secure in my home. We know that's not true, but sometimes we as industry professionals or adult children, we sort of forget that for a minute, right? And because we are so focused on solving this problem of making sure that our loved ones don't fall or something bad doesn't happen to them. But we start thinking about them as a problem to be solved instead of that whole person. And the moment you step back and think about the love and the joy and all those things and the memories that they can still make, it can make a huge difference. So, you know, for example, we know that social isolation can actually be as bad for somebody as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. That's AARP research that tells us that. So it's profound, the physical power of positivity. And you know this more than anybody. So we know that um, socialization and interaction and little moments of joy actually increases longevity. It can actually reduce depression and actually reduce falls. It can actually, you know, it can prolong or, you know, it can actually help with Alzheimer's and dementia in terms of, you know, reducing how fast that that will you know take effect yeah and i and i love that because again even with our own selves you know as you as we think about getting older and everything when you're surrounded by messaging that makes you feel more frail more vulnerable people are treating you like you know here let me help you with everything it is almost like reinforces a helplessness, right? Whereas staying vital and just helping people where they need help. But again, that positivity, I think is so key. Now, a couple of findings that I want to get to that I really love. First of all, um, you did a or found in the survey um, that there was a great percentage of adult children who consider their older parent, their best friend. I love that because I think of my mom as my best friend, but tell us a little bit about that and also some of the other key findings that you had. Oh, for sure. Um, yeah, more than half of adult children report that their their parent is their best friend. I, I just love hearing that. I was actually surprised to hear that that was such a high percentage. But then literally as soon as we got those survey results, I was speaking with my, one of my colleagues and she was actually telling me that her grandmother is her best friend, literally her best friend. And that was great to hear. She was telling me about some of the traditions because, you know, when you hear a stat like that, it's so important to think about how just to maintain those social connections and how important it is and the positive benefits on, on you as the adult child in terms of your happiness and your connection, as well as on that senior loved one. So my colleague was telling me that every Sunday she gets on a call or a Zoom with her grandmother and they watch TV together at the same time. So synchronized watching. And they were recently watching the entire series of Downton Abbey because that's what her grandmother really loved. And I, just I love that so much. <laughs> and, you know, some of those things in that best friends, it's born out of those traditions that it's so important to keep and remember. So for her, she was just reminiscing about how she would, you know, I guess, prepare the long beans on the porch with her grandmother all the time. And some of those warm traditions that sort of created that bonding that had led to that just really awesome Sunday night that she just never misses. Well, and again, it's not like, Grandma, how are you feeling? Grandma, let me help you do this. It's creating these new memories, right, yeah, that exactly. we get. And I think both sides really benefit. You know, we've seen so many studies that show that, you know, grandparents who spend more time with their grandchildren 
the older adult feels more relevant. They feel like they can share their wisdom, you know, of living longer with their young grandkids and the grandkids actually get a better sense of resiliency because they they know who they are, where they came from. They hear about the stories of how grandma and grandpa, you know, walked to school in the snow. That's like the famous story we always hear it on yeah. right? Both but, ways uphill. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> The thing is, is that it kind of sa- it says to us, okay, other people have struggled and had challenges as well, but they got through it. And I think that's a such a great message. Um, you know, one of the things that I just want to touch on here is um, some of the interesting findings that the adult children didn't realize maybe that their parent had done this or played a musical instrument or whatever. Yeah. So tell us about that finding. That was really great. Yeah, so... We know that actually over half of them said that um, they learned new things about their parents. And so some of them were really surprising, like maybe there was something significant in their personal lives, like they were married or maybe had a significant other that they never knew about. Uh, Many of them actually said that their parent had participated in a historical event. Actually, most commonly, it was World War II which is such an interesting finding. And I think this one is cute that a lot of them didn't even know that their parents actually had hidden little keepsakes from from their past that they kept or that they had hidden talents like uh, singing or dancing or something like that, Um, which is just so great to think about all the things you don't know. Because again, you think about your parent is a whole person with memories and all those joys and everything that you are. But sometimes you just forget that they lived those full, really interesting and and, um, adventurous lives. Um, And there's some, we talked about the benefit to us as adult children and others, actually 88% of them said that doing activities with their aging loved one or their parent actually helped give them a positive impact. So we knew that there was such a benefit to that. Um, It's really just, it's just profound. Well, I think that's great because again, I think sometimes we look at aging as, you know, it's this decline, it's about disease or disability or whatever, and it doesn't obviously have to be. Uh, there's been other studies that have been done that show that, that we actually are our happiest in our late 70s and 80s, even happier than when we were in our 20s, which always is a little surprising, but, you know, that's that U curve of happiness is something that a lot of people talk about. Um, you know, the U.S. Surgeon General just came out with a report actually today that talked about social media and the impact on teens and the fact that teens are spending anywhere between four and eight hours a day on social media. And this is really exacerbating a lot of the mental health issues. Now, I want to flip that script because you actually found some really positive aspects of social media to help older adults stay connected to their loved ones. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, for sure. You know, it's, it, you know, we talked about you know the impact on the teens. Social media is a great way for teens to bond with their grandparents because, believe it or not, our seniors are on social media. Three quarters of those adult children say that they use social media to stay connected to their parents. Their parents are on social media even at you know more advanced years. And two thirds of them say that their parents actually use social media to stay connected to people from their past. They get it. Mm -hmm. So they are, you know, that stimulation of your memory and the things that are important to you and your, you know, it has such a positive impact on, on our brains. You know, they say that their seniors actually use social media to learn about new things. Mm, Yeah. Positive benefit to that. And we, and we know the lifelong learning piece is another, you know, again, it's that positive looking forward that helps keep us living longer and living healthier and happier. You know, it's interesting that you say they connect with people maybe from their past. I remember years ago, I had done a TV pilot and it was with a World War II veteran who had been at the Battle of the Bulge. Wow. And he actually went to, he got a little computer coaching from his grandson and he was able to reconnect with his buddies that had been in that battle in World War II with him that he hadn't spoken to in, you know, 50 or 60. Yeah, it was just amazing. So you're right. There's that power of technology to connect us, which I think is really positive. And uh, hopefully we could just restrain people from, you know, feeling the negative impacts of social media. I think if you can take a lesson from your grandparents, it's that, you know, don't sweat the small stuff and you know, use it to connect, but not to, not to feel bullied or anything else that's going on. Um, 
you know, some of, we talk about positivity and that really was the focus of your survey and the focus of what Comfort Keepers does. Um, tell us a little bit about some of those findings and why, why is that important for our overall health and longevity? Yeah, actually, you hear so much about people dreading their older years or dreading aging and there's some negative perceptions about it. So it was so great to hear the opposite in this survey because two thirds of adult children said that their parents had a positive attitude about aging. And that was flipped into several very tangible things. Number one, it improved their mood. The adult children reported that. It made their parents wanna be more active because they felt more positive about what was going on with their lives. And also that they wanted to try new things. So those were three very important things that I think that being positive actually can help facilitate and foster in our senior loved ones. And again, all of that actually helps to improve longevity. Those little moments of positivity and joy and all of that mindset can actually help us thrive and live later in life. Yeah. And so now let's kind of shift gears a bit. I want to talk a little bit about the activities around National Day of Joy and what Comfort Keepers helps create for that special day. And again, going back to the survey, I noticed that there were some concerts that older adults and their parents go to together. You know, you mentioned the cooking with your mom and that's such a special, you know, aspect of family life and all that. But tell, tell us a little bit about what are the activities then that you're helping to promote and, and kickstart on the National Day of Joy on June 26th? So we have offices all over the country and over a hundred of them are celebrating in all kinds of different ways. And some of the fun things that are doing are, you know, one office is having a joy ride on the water, like a joy cruise, you know, complete with music and entertainment um, we have a lot of offices doing things like ice cream socials, luau's, actually taking ice cream trucks out into the community, um, even with seniors, et cetera, which is great. Um, we have garden parties. We have actually my favorite one is senior proms. We have a couple offices doing senior proms this year, complete with kings and queens and the whole deal. And um, we would just ask that everybody think about on June the 26th to stop and remember how important joy is for you and others. Do something, first of all, to bring yourself joy, whether it's something big or something small, and then do something to bring joy to others. And let's think about all the joy and positivity we can spread. And you know what? We would love it if you would post about it on social media and use the hashtag National Day of Joy so we can see what an impact and how far our message is spreading. What I love about that, and, you know, you celebrate this at least, you know, every year, obviously, and we want to have those moments or have those activities we can look forward to. I think it becomes so important as we get older. Again, you know, it's great to to certainly connect and visit and stay stay socially connected and all that, but to have an event that you're looking forward to as you get older and there's not as many of those events around to me is just that's kind of this whole you know surge of joy to be able to have something like that to plan for and to get excited about which is wonderful and you guys are so great for doing that um is there anything else Sadia that we didn't cover maybe on you know activities or anything from the survey that we missed that's really important I think that those are the most important things. Again, it's the theme is the power of positivity. If you remember nothing else, remember that. That little moment of ways that you can stay positive and help your senior loved ones stay positive will make such a difference in every single aspect of their life and their longevity. And that is a great message for all of us. <laughs> You know, yeah. it's it's great for our elders. It's a great, yeah. yeah, exactly. I was going to say, anybody listening to this podcast mm -hmm. is going to get something out of that. So tell us again where uh, our listeners can find information about Comfort Keepers and the National Day of Joy. Oh, for sure. Just go to comfortkeepers.com. We actually have the survey there with some information about the National Day of Joy. And you can learn more about Comfort Keepers and, and how it is that we bring joy to others, how we uh, our caregiving services, and also where you can find us because we're in offices all over the country. Which is so terrific. And again, it's just such a pleasure to have you back to talk about joy because what a great topic. It's one of my favorite topics. And you know, we'll have you back next year to tell us what the survey results are next year. But thank That's you, great. Sadia, for, thank for you joining so us. And this brings <laughs> me joy. Yeah, me too. All right. Have a great one. Bye-bye. 
so I just love that interview with Sadia. It's it was so uplifting and makes you feel good to know that you know the the strong family bonds are really important in life. Certainly helping all of us live longer, healthier, and happier, uh, but particularly important for our older adults. Now we're going to turn to our next interview, which is actually with two people. As I mentioned, Deborah Levy, who is the executive director of the Alzheimer's Association Orange, Orange County in Southern California, as well as Dr. Charles Wilcox, who is a board member for the Alzheimer's Association of Orange County, but he's also a clinical researcher and the author of this book. I'm going to hold it up. It's Demystifying the Alzheimer's Maze. And I just mentioned that all the proceeds from Dr. Wilcox's book goes to the Alzheimer's Association. So this is a double bonus. If you want to learn everything you wanted to know about Alzheimer's and make a donation to Alzheimer's by Dr. Wilcox's book. You know, most of us who are authors are out there, we're promoting our books and, you know, uh, hoping to do good and share good information. But this is actually even going further than that with Dr. Wilcox's book, which is really great. But this is going to be a great interview for those of you who are interested in um, Alzheimer's and uh, dementia and caregiving and all the things that are happening in the Alzheimer's world. We're going to try to touch upon as many things as possible in this short interview, but um, here we go with Deborah Levy and Dr. Wilcox. So I'm really thrilled to have actually two very special guests on for our next segment, where we're going to focus on a discussion around Alzheimer's disease. We have Deborah Levy, who is the executive director of the Alzheimer's Association of Orange County in Southern California. And we also have Dr. Charles Wilcox with us, who is a board member of the Alzheimer's Association in Orange County, also an advocate for AIM, which is the policy and advocacy uh, division or group in the Alzheimer's Association. And he's also been a clinical researcher in Alzheimer's disease for over 40 years. So welcome to both of you to Caregiving Club on Air. Thank you. Pleasure to yeah. be here. Thank you, Sherry, for having us. Well, it's great to have you both. And as I said, as June is, uh, you know, Alzheimer's and Brain Health Awareness Month, we thought it's a perfect time to bring you both on. Uh, so we have a bonus of having both of you today. But I want to start first, Deborah, with you, because... You know, a lot of people that um, are engaged in Alzheimer's caregiving say that they wish they'd known about the Alzheimer's Association when they were a caregiver. They discover it sometimes afterwards. But tell us a little bit about, tell our listeners, what is the, are the supports and programs that you can provide to caregivers who have a loved one with Alzheimer's or dementia? Well, first of all, I want to just mention that we are in communities across the country because we are the Alzheimer's Association. So we have chapters in all 50 states, and we really do believe that we're in all communities. Um, we serve about 7 million Americans living with the disease, and there are 11 million caregivers every year. As I mentioned, we have a presence in all 50 states through our local chapter offices, we also collaborate with um, many tribal and tribal organizations as well. And the Alzheimer's Association partners with about 30 national and over 900 local organizations across the country to address the health inequities in underserved and underrepresented communities. And some of the services that we provide, education programs, I'd love to dive in a little bit deeper about our 24 seven helpline. We have support groups. We have a trial match program so that if somebody is diagnosed with the disease, we can help them navigate that clinical trial process. But the biggest thing I want folks to know is that wherever they live in the country, we can support them. Which I think is tremendous. And, you know, you mentioned the 24 seven. I think a lot of times, um, you know, caregivers are looking for good information and they don't always realize that there's also resources out there to help them, to help them, you know, guide them on this journey, which we know can be a long one with Alzheimer's. Tell us just quickly about that 24 um, seven hotline. So um, it is 24 seven. I'm going to give the number out. It's 800-272-3900. And you can be calling if you're in a crisis moment, you can call for a referral. So whether you need to find long-term care or a physician in your community, 
Um, you can call just to talk to somebody if you're recently diagnosed and you're a person living with the disease trying to navigate it. The helpline is confidential. Uh, we provide crisis assistance. We'll be able to provide local resources and information to individuals. We have master's level clinicians who can answer the calls as well. And the other thing that I want to mention is that we can answer calls in over 200 different languages. So whatever language somebody is most comfortable in, hopefully we're able to help them in that native language. Which, you know, it's so fantastic to have that type of resource. And I really hope our listeners are taking note and writing this down for themselves or other family members or friends. I just sat in on a caregiving task force meeting with the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregivers, and it was with employers. And the number one thing that employees are asking for is care navigation. Help me figure out the resources. Give me that trusted confidence, you know, that I'm being connected to the best. And that's exactly what you're doing. So thank you so much for sharing that. Dr. Wilcox, I want to turn to you because, you know, there's so much that we could cover and we're going to try to tackle a few of the topics today. But, um, you know, a lot of the statistics right now, the latest Alzheimer's Association report that came out says there's nearly 7 million Americans now who um, have Alzheimer's or related dementias. We know that number will almost double to 13 million over the next couple, you know, three decades. But there's a higher uh, risk, if you will, in the African-American and Latino communities. And also we know two thirds of all Alzheimer's adults are women. Tell us a little bit about those special populations and why do you think they're those populations have more risk or we're finding more prevalence of the disease there? What do we know? Well, we're learning more and more about that, Sherry, especially some of the research being done by the Alzheimer's Association. You know, with respect to the African-American community, there's at least three kind of cohort contributing factors, beginning with um, there's a higher incidence of cardiovascular disease in the African-American community, which in turn leads to risk factors that go, go on to dementia. Also, you, you may recall from your days at USC, there's a gentleman there named Dr. Caleb Finch, who's done a lot of research on pollution. And when we look back over the years, many African-American communities are in places or people who lived or still live in areas where there's more pollution by industry. And then thirdly, we also believe that to some extent, it may be socioeconomic, where if you've been to Whole Foods lately, you can see that buying healthy food is very expensive. So with respect to the African-American community, we think those are three contributing factors. With respect to Latinos, um, according to the National Institutes of Health, um, the Latino community does have a statistically significantly higher rate of obesity, which in turn leads to two other big risk factors, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, which in turn leads to higher chances for dementia. The good thing is for both of those communities, some of these things are definitely modifiable risk factors. So it, it's probability, but it's not certain destiny. So there are things we can do, as, as Deb mentioned, reaching out to these underserved communities. With respect to women, uh, there's a little good news on that front. Um, first off, I think over the years, one of the reasons why it was such a dramatic difference was longevity. Women were living longer. But on the positive end, what we're finding is amongst those risk factors, one very important one is education. And 50, 60, 70 years ago, women were not getting access to education like men. Now, over the last 20 years, we look at data, that gap is narrowing as women get more and more access to education. And if we look at young people today in the 20s and 30s, I think women are actually passing men in terms of education and advanced education and things. So while women still are more likely, higher probable, the gap is narrowing for good reasons. Right. So the, the message is stay in school yes. <laughs> and keep up with that lifelong learning, I guess. You know, yeah. um, so explain for our listeners, because so often I get questions about what's really the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's. And we're hearing so much more now, you know, Bruce Willis, the, the famous actor originally was diagnosed with aphasia and then ultimately with frontotemporal dementia. Tell us a little bit about what is the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's? And then how many different types of dementia are out there? 
Yeah, that's a, a really important question because it does seem, depending upon which expert panel you're listening to, it could be anywhere from five to seven to nine different types of dementia. One that's very rare, but I remember as a child hearing about was when people, they call it punch drunk. That's a fancy term called dementia pugilistica, where boxers get so many hits to the head, they get dementia. We're looking at now in NFL football players. But in general, to answer that question more directly, Sherry, is that Dementia is the umbrella term, much like someone says, I have cancer. Well, immediately you, you wonder, do they have breast cancer, prostate cancer, colon cancer? Well, depending, again, which expert we listen to, probably about 70 to 75 percent of dementia is DAT, dementia of the Alzheimer's type. Now, our organization, the Alzheimer's Association, has kind of changed the slogan for the last 10 or 15 years, mentioning that we want to help serve all types of dementia in our research and, and in our outreach as well. But again, the, the, the highest probability is about 70, 75% uh, is dementia of the Alzheimer's type. And then tell me a little bit about MCI, because I, I get a lot of questions on, is MCI actually dementia? And how is that different then from Alzheimer's or other dementias? Right, and it's, it is finally now getting more publicity where people I mean, even using the term MCI, mild cognitive impairment. Some of the literature I looked at before said about 40% of people who demonstrate the symptoms of MCI go on to develop dementia of the Alzheimer's type. Um, if we have time for it later, we might talk about some of the new medications that have come out and things like that, where they're actually on that cusp, where people have this mild cognitive impairment. And probably the main, one of the main distinguishing characteristics between MCI a dementia of the Alzheimer's type would be the degree to which people are really having serious impairments. To wit, it's not that serious yet. Many people are still at work. They have coping mechanisms, but it is kind of a warning signal that more severe symptomatology could be not too far down the line. Yeah, and you know, you mentioned some of the new um, diagnostic tools and and discoveries and uh, things like biomarkers and and blood tests and all that. And I know the Alzheimer's Association, beyond all of the wonderful programs and supports and everything, um, it also provides funding for research. So let's dive into that. And Deborah, you can also jump in here on the research funding that the Alzheimer's Association does. But I'd love to know what are the, the newest, latest tests that maybe we should all be looking forward to to determine whether or not we may have uh, early signs of dementia? Chuck, can I, Dr. Wilcox, I'm going <laughs> to pop in and just Absolutely. high level before you get into some of the details Please. Share with your listeners that, you know, we, the Alzheimer's Association, accelerate global research. That is one of the things that we're known for. Um, currently, we're investing $405 million in over 1,100 active best-of-field dementia projects in 56 countries, spanning almost all of the continents. Right now, we're in six of the continents. Um, Charles and I are both from the Orange County, California community locally in California, we're investing about $62 million in research that's being um, conducted in the state of California. So now Chuck, I'll hand it over to you. Sure, and I'm glad you brought that up, Deb, because it really uh, it resonates, I think, with everyone, the fact that this is a global uh, disease, tragic disease and challenge for everyone. One of the things the Alzheimer's Association did probably 15 years ago was a collaboration between, I forget the, which Nordic country it was, Norway or Sweden, and the University of Washington, looking at modifiable risk factors. And the research they did on that was aerobic exercise. And they found people who did aerobic exercise 30 minutes or more, three days a week or more, versus people who did stretching or other things, really showed less cognitive decline and more cognitive reserve by that aerobic exercise. So um, with respect to some of the new things that are ongoing right now, and I think you, you mentioned, Sherry, you know, biomarkers and things like that, that is a, a game changer. It is a wonderful, wonderful thing that's come out. In the, at the 2023 Alzheimer's International Conference, our association made a policy statement where they didn't feel just yet that these biomarkers were ready for um, layperson commercial development and 
access to the public. But of course, the developers developers of those have have not all agreed with that, and they do have them commercially available now. As a quick example, there's a company at uh, affiliated with St. Louis University called C2N Diagnostics, and they have a test called Precivity AD, and they're looking at, at biomarkers as well. Uh, it's about $1,250, but they have a sliding scale. And what we're trying to do here, Sherry, is <clears throat> we know that Alzheimer's, unlike having a stroke or heart attack, is not an acute event. It's a 10, 15, 20-year on-ramp. So if we can get warning signs earlier, before people have signals, we can look at these modifiable risk factors. We can look at medications. We can look at things to, like taxes, defer, 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 or more importantly, not to make light of it, if we can do things to delay this to the point where people don't even see the symptoms till they're in their 80s or 90s, or maybe not at all, that will be a true game changer. And these blood-based biomarkers and other types of biomarkers, I think will get us there. I, I really do. And so are we able to do those blood tests today or are they still a little bit out in the future? We are able to do them today. Uh, as I say, okay. they are they are commercially available. For example, Quest Labs has one called AD Detect. Um, in fact, in 2023, uh, when, when I published my book, it was $500. Now it's already down to $350 because it's being used more and more. And there's actually a skin test. I forget, the, I think it's called Synapse. They maintain they have Medicare approval. That's about $2,200 for the first test and $500 for the verification. But, but that's a skin test that will let people know, they say, with between 90 and 95% probability. Um, and then again, I say there, there, Roche has a diagnostic test. There's about five or six, but many more in the pipeline coming. And FDA is looking at them and giving them fast track status because you know, it's like those who might have heart disease in their family, you wouldn't dare go to the doctor and not get your cholesterol and triglycerides checked for maybe $20, $30. If we can get to that for these blood-based biomarkers for Alzheimer's and other dementia, that is going to be truly a, a, a paradigm shift that's beyond all recognition. It will be wonderful. Yeah, I think for me me personally, I, I probably would rather take a blood test than, than get a PET scan. That would just be me personally, but anyway, uh, Deborah, you were going to say something. No, I was wondering, Chuck, if you would talk about maybe the two uh, drugs that are currently on the market um, and one that has uh, FDA advisory approval and just that they're not um, cures for the disease, but for some individuals right now, we finally have some treatments on the market that can slow the progression of Alzheimer's disease. And so maybe you could talk about that too. You bet. And this is, again, very recent news, with the most recent one being Monday, June 10th, the ADCOM, which is a fancy term for Advisory Committee at FDA, voted 11 to nothing, unanimously recommending approval of Eli Lilly's DMT, sorry for these acronyms, disease-modifying treatment called Denanumab. Now, that's a drug where, and a company, Lilly, they've been working in this space for 28 years. <laughs> this will be their first success, Denanumab. And that drug, along with the first disease-modifying treatment that's commercially available, lecanemab, called Lakembi. That's marketed by a company called Aside. They, they manufacture the biggest selling drug for Alzheimer's called Aricept. But their disease-modifying compound was approved January 6, 2023, called Lakembi. And both Lakembi and denanumab currently are being administered by infusion, in other words, intravenously. So with Lakembi, it's every two weeks right now, um, and it may change over time. And with Denanumab, I think it's every four weeks, but I'm not certain of that. But with Lakembi, there's also research going on right now, and the FDA is giving them, they call a rolling approval, to look at auto-injectors. So that would mean patients would not need to go into a healthcare professional every two or every four weeks to get the medicine. But the important thing that you know, I want to share with your listeners is that, well, these are not platinum magic bullets. They do make a significant difference. In the New England Journal articles, it showed that it can be slow the decline by about 27% and denanumab by about 38.6% on cognitive function and global function, day-to-day -day activity, activities of daily living. And that's very significant if that's your loved one and they recognize their grandchildren longer or can pay their own bills longer or remain independent longer. These are um, 
I want to stop short of saying, you know, hugely beneficial. They're not, but they are importantly beneficial. And <clears throat> those numbers I'm giving are averages. There's actually some people who do better, some don't get as much benefit, and you don't know. And, and, and to give full disclosure, there was a, an article in the paper yesterday, a well-known neurologist in um, Santa Monica, he won't give them to any of his patients because he doesn't believe there's a good risk-benefit ratio because there are some side effects. But the Alzheimer's Association, and every patient advocacy group I know is elated that these medicines are now going to be available. They give hope and they do give legitimate help. So it really is finally a big, big step forward. And I believe we'll encourage additional research with other mechanisms of action for other types of etiology, for other types of dementia. So I, I think it's just going to open the floodgate. And at least that's my hope. Yeah, and I think it really did re-energize re the research community because it had been over 20 years since we'd had any new, uh, you know, breakthroughs. One, one question I have, though, is as as we're talking, I just want to make sure our listeners understand that Alzheimer's disease is a, a neurodegenerative progressive disease so that you do uh, unfortunately get worse over time. Um, tell us at what point these particular drugs are effective and also what's the cost? Because I know there was a little bit of controversy over how much they cost and whether they'd be covered, you know, by Medicare. Care. Uh, what's the latest on that? Yeah, it's a really uh, timely question. There was a lot of controversy about that. Um, with respect to the cost, I just looked it up this morning too. Denatumab, I'm not sure, not certain what what I'm sure what cost that will come out at. Um, Lakembi is about twenty six thousand dollars per year, and while that's not inexpensive, if you look at the top five selling oncology drugs. They're north of 150,000. The top five selling arthritis drugs, they're north of 85,000 per year. The top five multiple sclerosis. There's at least four or five indications where these medicines are much, much more expensive than these medicines for the brain. So I do think to some extent, because we don't have a hard outcome measure, you know, like if we if we look at asthma, your asthma attacks are down. We look at diabetes, is your A1C down? You know, Alzheimer's is more of a global function thing. So we've got multiple measures we look at. But I really think, you know, as a taxpayer um, for Medicare, which the Alzheimer's Association has done a splendid job advocating on patients' behalf for CMS to fully reimburse for these patients, and they're going to get that. But to your first question there, Sherry, who are these patients really looking at? Ironically, going back to use of the term MCI and early AD, those were the patients put in these trials for both Lilly and ASI. So people on that cusp of the earliest AD, maybe advancing rapidly, MCI, they did the best in the study. So then we get back again to the importance of early diagnosis and early intervention. There was a, a patient uh, at a friend of mine's site in um, Florida they had him on television the night like Hemby was approved. They showed his test scores. Obviously, he was an aberration, but they showed his test scores from when he began working on, with that research site from four years prior. He had zero decline. Wow. So, so he helps their stats. You know, and right. someone else maybe declined rapidly, which is why right. I get to everyone's chemistry is different. But right. we want early diagnosis. We want early treatment. And, and that's what's most beneficial. Well, and to that point and that message about early interventions, you know, we all know that very often by the time someone's diagnosed, they probably have been living with the disease maybe between 10 and 20 years. And I just read a really great Wall Street Journal article that talked about the fact that Alzheimer's is not a disease of older people. It is a disease for everyone. And the way to think about it is when you start earlier in life with some of these lifestyle uh, changes and things that you can do, then you're going to decrease your risk for later in life of maybe developing the disease. So let's talk about that. Let's dive in first. Uh, Dr. Wilcox, with you, the Lancet Commission came out with, you know, some of these modifiable lifestyle choices. You mentioned a couple, you know, live in a place, hopefully, where there's not a lot of pollution or food deserts. But what are some of the other things that our listeners can do to hopefully maybe prevent Alzheimer's or at least delay a diagnosis for them? You bet. And the first two are ones we've all heard all of our life, diet and exercise, diet and exercise. And, you know, it, it, it is amazing how what we eat does determine a lot of our brain health later on. There's a, there's a husband and wife couple 
at Loma Linda, the Shrizai, the neurologists who have the longevity institute there, actually have a book about things we can eat, you know, that are proper. So if we get away from potato chips and soda, and we have things like avocado and blueberries and um, olive oil, things like that, there are things we can do. Uh, another kind of interesting thing that's been replicated, again, with research with the Alzheimer's Association, both throughout the US, but also in Finland and Norway, is midlife obesity. So midlife obesity is a huge risk factor and it's modifiable. You know, if we intervene earlier, then that's that's something we can do. Um, a controversial one, although most people agree with it, but not everyone yet, is stress. We all know, even the people who don't say it's a direct causative factor for Alzheimer's, we do know and everyone agrees that stress is hard on our immune system. Many people do believe it's also a causative factor for, um, you know, a risk factor for Alzheimer's, particularly sustained stress with no end in sight. Short-term stress, when you're working on a project, that can be actually good for us, but this long-term sustained, no end in sight stress is bad for us. Yeah. Um, and and you know, I didn't mention earlier, and I'm going to hold it up because Dr. Wilcox, you are also the author of a wonderful book. I and mean, hopefully you can see this on the screen, just demystifying the Alzheimer's maze. And you do mention nutrition like the blue zones. We've heard so much about the blue zones diet, which is based on the Mediterranean diet. And then the, the version of that called the mind diet, which is really supposed to be the best for brain health. But you mentioned stress. And Deborah, I want to turn to you because one of the things we also know is that our social fitness is sometimes as important as our physical or emotional fitness. And one of the things the Alzheimer's Association does that, that I just think is wonderful is creates a community. You have support groups. You make caregivers feel that they are not alone. And so often with this disease, they're can still sometimes be stigma. Maybe our loved one has said, I don't want anyone to know if they have the diagnosis and it makes it really difficult. It's also such a different type of disease because the behavior change, the memory loss, the issues that can happen make it really tough on caregivers. Tell us a little bit about the types of supports and education and, and hopefully the de-stress uh, tools that you can give to caregivers. Well, I 100% agree that nobody should face Alzheimer's alone, and we are here to help 24-7 with, you know, our helpline. You mentioned our support groups. We have support groups across the country, both in person and virtual. We have support groups that um, meet for individuals who have early onset, so those who maybe just been diagnosed, there are special support groups uh, for those individuals. There are support groups for the caregivers because they really do um, need the help. They need to know that they're not alone. They need to be able to talk through you know, what, what they're going through and, and be able to hear about different resources that maybe others have in their community. Um, and anybody who's listening can go onto our website, which is alz.org. And in the search bar, they can search for support groups in their local community. So that's an easy way to find them. They can also call our 800 number, which is 800-272-3900, and they can find support groups that way. We also offer a myriad of um, videos on our website and our YouTube channel that are really great resources from knowing the 10 warning signs to um, doing financial planning uh, to, you know, healthy eating. Um, so we have, we have a lot of resources on our website as well. Um, we also have education programs that are happening pretty much every day across the country, online and in person, again, in a variety of languages. So uh, anybody who's listening can find out about those resources on our website. Yeah, and I think it's such a tremendous um, help. Again, caregivers often express this sense of, I feel all alone in my caregiving journey. And I think that's particularly true for people who are caring for a loved one with Alzheimer's dementia. We also know the, the, the studies have been done that show that Alzheimer's and dementia caregivers have higher levels of stress, lower immunity and antibodies to fight things like colds and, and flus and higher levels sometimes of depression. So all of those things are things we want to help you with and the Alzheimer's Association is is there for you. That's the community you can tap into um, because a lot of these things we're talking about are 
lifestyle things that could lead to higher risk, right? So we want to help you now to uh, to manage that. Um, it's been tremendous talking to both of you. We could probably stay on for a whole nother hour with all kinds of things, but I just want to ask, was there anything important we didn't cover that you feel the audience should should know or a takeaway for them? The only thing I would say would be um, there's you cannot stress enough the importance of early diagnosis and early intervention. And it, it empowers both the patient and the caregiver. And I, I believe, you know, it's it's time now where people have legitimate reasons to know that doing so can be beneficial to themselves and their loved ones. Yeah. And yeah. I would say advocate, 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 because we hear so many stories of individuals who don't get the proper diagnosis or their physician may be uncomfortable with making an Alzheimer's diagnosis or they, they may not know um, how to diagnose somebody with mild cognitive impairment. And if you're noticing changes in yourself or somebody that you love, keep advocating until you get the right answers. Yeah, those are two really wonderful messages. We know that Alzheimer's disease can be very costly for families. Deborah, you mentioned the financial planning side of this and, you know, giving that runway a longer, longer time frame so that families can plan ahead, maybe better financially is helpful. And also, as you said, advocating, I have always, you know, said, uh, let's get past the stigma, you know, let's make sure that we're supporting others who may come out and say, my loved one has Alzheimer's and be an advocate and a mentor and a supporter. Uh, for all of that, which is wonderful. Well, again, you both have shared so much wonderful, great information with our audience, but tell us again, I'll start with Deborah. where can our listeners find more information about the Alzheimer's Association? Uh, two places, alz.org. Our website also can be translated fully into Spanish. We're looking to do that in other languages as well. So that would be alz.org backslash Espanol. So chock full of resources there. And then our 800 number, 1-800-272-3900. Wonderful. And Dr. Wilcox, where can our listeners uh, follow up with you and find more information? Uh, well, uh, just through the Alzheimer's Association would be, would be best. Everything through that. Great. As, yes, yes you me. are as a board member, exactly. You're you're a great supporter of that. Well, again, thank you both for being on this um, special segment that we're doing around Alzheimer's and Brain Health Awareness Month. It was great to talk to both of you. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, Sherry, for having us. So wasn't that great information from Deborah Levy and Dr. Wilcox on Alzheimer's? I mean, there's so much more we could have talked about, as I mentioned, but lots of really good information, I think, to take away, to think about, um, have a conversation with your family, but always know that the Alzheimer's Association is there to support you as a caregiver. So let's turn now to Well Home Design News. And we we have so much on this episode. I'm not going to do a whole lot in this segment, but I did want to just mention quickly that Again, um, part of my book uh, was about our environments and how we can maximize our environmental wellness for healing and for health. And I do a webinar on dementia-friendly design. I also do one on more general age-friendly design. But this one is very specific for you know, caregivers of those with Alzheimer's. And I wanted to offer it for free as kind of a public service during this month of National Alzheimer's and Brain Health Awareness Month. So we're going to have a link to that dementia-friendly design, home design. Uh, webinar on our episode guide page. You can check that out. Um, also just wanted to mention some news that is related, I think, to just overall social fitness that we've been talking about, social wellness, and that's helping our older loved ones stay engaged. And sometimes when, you know, when they're not um, driving anymore or, um, you know, they're just a little bit more less mobile, they don't kind of get out of the house and do enough. And if we're working, it's difficult because we can't, you know, maybe be there to take them places. So Uber recently, the rideshare company Uber just recently announced a caregiver app. Very interesting. You know, they've been working with health systems now for a long time, but this is a very specific move by Uber to kind of capture the attention, I think, of family caregivers. 
Um, hopefully the uh, the Uber drivers and fleet of cars will certainly be more open to the needs of family caregivers and their older adults, because I know in the past, a lot of them won't pick up people with a walker or a wheelchair. And that's where I really love another app and service called GoGo Grandparent. Because GoGo Go Grandparent works with Uber, as well as Lyft and other rideshare companies, and they serve as a concierge service where they will follow the adult for you via GPS, make sure they get picked up and dropped off properly, and they also work with drivers who have signed an agreement to pick up someone who might need help in and out of the car, who has a walker or a wheelchair they can put in the trunk. So. You may want to check that out, but I just thought that was interesting news because, again, it's another avenue for us as family caregivers to think about, um, is this another solution to help us keep our older loved ones kind of socially active and engaged, which we know helps overall health. Um, now, also, June is National Employee Wellness Month. And I, I wrote in my book, there's a whole chapter around um, intellectual wellness. And part of that chapter is around life work balance, not work life balance. I flip it life work balance because I feel like life should come first and then work. But how do we find better balance? And part of the conversation and the writing that I did for that was in this area of biophilic design, which biophilic means love of life, love of nature, biophilia, it's a Greek word. And it's really about bringing nature inside. We're seeing so much more of this. I was just at a restaurant the other day and there were trees, you know, inside the restaurant, um, beautiful windows looking outside on some beautiful shrubbery. There were wonderful, gorgeous uh, wood panels along the ceiling really gave you a sense of comfort. Um, and you felt it. The minute you walked into the restaurant, you just kind of felt like, take a deep breath, you know, kind of I'm in a garden or a forest area. So it really does have a lot to do with how our brains work. And biophilic design is something, if you haven't heard of it, you are going to hear a lot about it over the next 10, 20 plus years, because it is the new movement in office design, restaurant design, commercial design, and home design. And so I'm going to share an excerpt from my book on biophilic design. And also a couple articles that I wrote for uh, PBS Next Avenue that I'll share with you that talk about how do you find biophilic design on a budget, uh, you know, and some other um, advantages to incorporating that into both our homes, but also our loved ones' homes as well, and our offices. If Again, HR people out there, uh, you know, employees out there who are listening, let's bring more of that into the office environment to make it more welcoming and comforting and brain soothing. Um, so with that, I'm now going to turn to our Me Time Monday wellness hack. And as I mentioned, June is World Music Month. So we're going to share with you some insights into musical menus and sonic seasoning, which are terms that I wish I had coined, but actually Dr. Charles Spence at the University of Oxford, who is a gastrophysicist, and you're going to learn what that's about. Uh, he coined those terms, and we're going to share with you the power between dining and eating and music and how it can really help our health and certainly our brain health. And that's our Me Time Monday wellness hack for you for this month. Here we go. Welcome to our Me Time Monday wellness hack. This episode, we focus on musical menus and sonic seasoning from research in my book, Me Time Monday. Researchers found there is a brain music connection where studies show listening to music can reduce anxiety, blood pressure, and pain, as well as improve sleep quality, mood, mental alertness, and memory. Recently, Charles Spence at the University of Oxford is leading new research in gastrophysics, combining dining with music. Using music and other multi-sensory inputs, such as taste, smell, and visual cues on lighting and visual decor, Spence can trick the brain into tasting foods in different ways, making them sweeter or more savory. He calls this brain rewiring hedonistic transfer effect, where he can create musical menus and sonic seasoning. Restaurants have long used background music to engage diners into eating and drinking more for decades. Now, the food industry is taking this music plus eating connection seriously. British Airways worked with food scientists such as Spence to create the Soundbite menu, which is a music and food pairing, because food loses 30% of its taste appeal on planes. The study showed 
that the passengers actually enjoyed the meal and felt it tasted 38 to 40 percent better when eating a meal paired with music. In Italy, there's an app to scan a wine label and it will give you the perfect music track to listen to while drinking that wine that is shown you will enjoy the wine more. And Spence is working with assisted living and memory care communities to improve the dining experience for older adults where age and medications can affect our taste buds. For instance, in Spence's research, by listening to lower pitched sounds such as drums, cellos, or baritone singers such as Johnny Cash, Frank Sinatra, Nina Simone, or Karen Carpenter, the food you eat will taste 38% more savory. This is great news for people with higher blood pressure who need to reduce the salt in their diet. Simply by listening to certain types of music, your brain thinks the food is saltier or more savory. The opposite happens when listening to high-pitched sounds such as a tinkling piano or sopranos such as Mariah Carey, Whitney Houston, Christina Aguilera, and Taylor Swift. With these higher tones, the food can taste up to 25% more sweet, which is great news for those who are dieting or who need to manage their sugar and insulin levels, such as people with diabetes. When it comes to music genres, scientists have discovered that jazz music makes any meal taste better. Johns Hopkins medical researchers asked jazz and hip hop artists to play music while getting a functional MRI. And they found the musicians' brains lit up like fireworks going off. The music is cross-training the brain since playing or singing along to music triggers different regions of the brain to work in harmony. Sleep science shows that foods such as cherries, kiwis, and milk, including oat, oat or almond milk, as well as nuts and fatty fish like salmon, can increase melatonin that helps you get to sleep. Just remember not to eat or drink at least three hours before bed. When eating these foods and listening to classical music before bedtime for 10 days, a study found women had more restorative sleep and slept longer for the next 30 days. Music is the soundtrack of our memories, but also our physical and mental health. We hope you enjoyed this Me Time Monday wellness hack. Each episode of our Caregiving Club on Air podcast features a new Me Time Monday wellness hack. You can find these and more in my new book, Me Time Monday, the weekly wellness plan to find balance and joy for a busy life. Or you can also visit MeTimeMonday.com or CaregivingClub.com. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Caregiving Club on Air. Please hit the subscribe button to listen to us on our newest channels, Amazon Music, SiriusXM, iHeartRadio, Pandora, as well as Spotify, Apple, and Google Podcasts and other listening channels. Check out all the resources and article links on our episode guide page at caregivingclub.com. Just hit the podcast tab at the top and email us with comments and questions at podcast at caregivingclub.com. Thank you again for listening. Take care and stay well.